Okay, well, thank you so much. This is my first time presenting via Teams as opposed to Zoom or some of the other webinar types of things. And I am so honored and humbled to be invited to speak with you all this afternoon. Um, I was given this topic back on December 18th. And since that time, like many of you, I've been on the edge of my seat, uh, waiting to see what's gonna happen next, praying for the peaceful transfer of power and kind of searching my own soul for a path to unity in our democratic government. So thank you all for joining me in the middle of Unity Week on the very heels of Joe Biden being sworn in as our 46th president. Um, there's a lot that we can unpack from the title, Election 2020, Do Politics Play a Role in How We Learn at a University? Um, one thing I'm not going to attempt to unpack is the entire 2020 election in our time here today. Instead, I kind of want to start from where we are in the wake of the 2020 election, um, how we can su sustain today's successful transfer of power and start to move toward unity in our country and especially in our community. Um, it's impossible for me as I'm teaching students about the Constitution, civil rights and civil liberties to ignore politics and political issues. The Constitution is government and government's politics. So with politics comes disagreement. It's not very often that we get a unanimous Supreme Court decision that all of the students in my class are going to agree on any political issue. And I know it's not just in my classes, it's in all of our classes where we're working to develop our students' ability to think for themselves, develop those critical thinking skills. So I wanna start the presentation with a spoiler alert. My answer to the question, do politics play a role in how we learn at our university is yes. But I think it's up to each of us as faculty and staff to determine what that role is and how it plays out in our classrooms and extracurricular activities. So over the past month, as I prepared this presentation, there was a question in the back of my mind for the first time in my life as to whether we would have a peaceful transfer of power. Um, the electoral process on January 6th was not peaceful, but we got through it. And Joe Biden has been sworn in as the 46th president of the United States of America. I'm sure people way smarter than I am will spend years unpacking the 2020 election. So for today, it's just a backdrop and I'm more interested in how we can pack it up and move forward together than on focusing specifically on any particular events rated, related to election 2020. So instead, I'd like to spend our time together unpacking politics, and unpacking learning in light of our stated mission and values at the University of St. Francis. So the first topic to unpack is politics. What is politics? Merriam-Webster offers these three definitions. So this afternoon, we're gonna focus on A, the art or science of government, and C, the art or science concerned with winning and holding control over government. Elections focus on C, winning and losing, power and control. Elections make us adversaries and can put us on a crash course in a struggle to determine who will have power. Elections have winners and losers. Candidates compete for votes, but when the election is over, it's time to stop competing, stop seeing ourselves as winners and losers, and start governing. Um, I'm reading Simon Sinek's new book now entitled, uh, it's the, um, the Infinite Game. So if you've heard of that, it's a great book. Elections are finite and require a finite mindset, and governing is an infinite process that requires an infinite mindset. So in the election process, people take sides in a way that creates resistance and stalemate. We meet our opponents head on like a couple of Dr. Seuss's Zacks refusing to budge. Never budge in the least, not an inch to the west, not an inch to the east. 
And that's not government. That kind of politics is never going to work. Those who are disempowered eventually reach a critical mass that leads to revolution. But it doesn't have to be that way. Politics at its best is governing by consent and cooperation. And cooperation can be win-win. You don't have to lose for me to win, and I don't have to lose for you to win. We don't have to agree on everything. We just have to find a common ground where we can start to build a consensus. So another book I've read this past month was the historian John Meacham's book, The Soul of America. It's been very helpful in giving me the historical context to better understand what's been happening in American politics. And this quote was taken from an interview he gave on January 9th on a program called The 11th Hour with Brian Williams after the storming of the Capitol building on January 6th. And so Meacham said, if this country does not begin to see that politics is about the mediation of differences, the resolution of problems for a given period of time and not a Sherman-esque arena for total constant war warfare, then this is just a chapter in another unfolding history. We cannot, as Americans, continue to make politics an all-out war with each other, two opposing armies, each intent on destroying the other. If we are going to survive, we have to embrace that first definition of politics. We need an infinite mindset. We have to get back to governing. So that's Merriam-Webster's first definition of politics, the art or science of government, the art of we the people coming together and working together to establish justice, secure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare of our nation. I might be showing my age, but I still have that schoolhouse rock version of the preamble to the Constitution playing in my mind that I used to see on Saturday mornings. You know, the we the people in order to form a more perfect union. So anyway, I won't sing for you anymore today, I promise. Um, so who is included in we the people? Who has a voice? Who has a vote? Over the past 232 years, we the people has expanded and become more inclusive. Originally, in 1789, it was understood to mean white male landowners. The 14th Amendment in 1868 potentially expanded it to all men 25 years of age and older. And then in 1920, the 19th Amendment potentially expanded it to include women at least 21 years of age. Finally, in 1971, the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18 so that all adults male and female, could potentially have a vote and a voice in our government. And I say potentially because legislating it doesn't immediately make it so in the life of every, of every American. The struggle for inclusion continues. So going back to the topic I was giving and thinking about the role of politics at St. Francis, this is the definition I want to focus on. Politics is the art or science of government. Education is critical for a people committed to democracy and self-government. The University of St. Francis is an institution of higher learning. We are preparing our students both to govern themselves and to participate in our constitutional democracy. We want our students to become critical thinkers. Our country needs more people who know how to think for themselves. So let's compare what we value as a university to what we value as a nation. As a university, we have these Franciscan ideals, reverence, respect, peace, and justice. These are the kind of values that have the power to unite us. As a nation, we declared ourselves independent from British rule based upon the natural unalienable right that each person has to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Overall, these Franciscan ideals and 
our unalienable rights seem fairly compatible to me. So how have we become so divided among our friends and family and as a nation? It may help to think back um, to the last time we truly came together as a nation, September 11th, 2001. Those 9-11 attacks brought us together as a nation, but the common bond was fear, us versus them. And that's what's been playing out for most of our students' entire lifetimes. We're the good guys, but there are bad guys out there and maybe even among us. In fact, it's really hard to tell just by looking who is good and who is bad. So we become even more divided and distrust anyone who doesn't look like us and act like us and think like us. Instead of embracing our diversity as a strength and continuing to expand inclusiveness, we've moved further toward suspecting diversity and distrusting inclusivity. And now instead of us on the one hand and them on the other, there's us and them outside our country and them inside our country and them uncomfortably close to us. And before we know it, it seems like there's more and more of them and fewer and fewer of us. It's made us incredibly anxious to the point of paranoia and self-destruction. And how can we heal from that? How can we move from this politics of fear to a politics of hope? How can we intentionally create a place of unity and inclusivity in our classrooms, in our university, and in our nation? And for the simplest answer to that, I turn to the first philosophical story of us and them that I recall from my childhood. And you may have read it too. The Sneetches, right? The original us and them. The star belly Sneetches had bellies with stars and the plain belly Sneetches had none upon bars. And it took all of them spending all of their money running through Sylvester McMonkey McBean's star on and star off machine and complete chaos to realize that Sneetches are Sneetches and no kind of Sneetch is the best on the beaches. The most important thing about the Sneetches story is that the end result isn't uniformity. There are still Sneetches with stars and Sneetches without stars. And in politics, we are not going to get unanimity. Not if we're each doing our own thinking. We don't need one person doing all of our thinking for us. We need diversity. And for each of us to use our own experience, use our own minds, and use our own gifts and talents with mutual respect and understanding of a bigger picture. That's how we begin to work together to cooperate and build consensus. And that's what I want to happen for my students in my classes, especially when we're discussing politics. The last thing I want is for students to look to me for all the right answers or to try to guess or try to learn what I think instead of learning to think for themselves. So when it comes to higher education, there really is nothing more useless than a mind filled with someone else's thoughts. I want my students to learn to seek out reliable information, formulate their own opinions, and be able to support them. And I want them to be able to discuss those in class in a respectful and peaceful manner. So how do we do that in our classrooms when everything in the news and social media is increasingly disrespectful and filled with personal attacks. The first thing we have to do is to move from binary thinking toward understanding. It's not either or, it's not us, and us or them, it's us. We're all human and we're all doing our best. As human beings, our first inclination is often to react criticize, judge other people. It's human nature, but we can do better. We can learn to recognize our instinct 
to judge and understand that this kind of judgment creates conflict. It creates competition and division. And we need less judging and more understanding. Understanding builds consensus, cooperation, and unity. Judgment is binary and competitive. Understanding opens up a spectrum for cooperation. So we all have the instinct as human beings to compare ourselves with each other. It's a survival skill in a hostile world. We instantly judge all of the ways that another person is like me or different, safe or a threat, good or bad, right or wrong. If they're like me, if they agree with me, they're right. If not, they're wrong. In fact, if the only way for me to be right is for you to be wrong, and the only way for you to be right is for me to be wrong, we're, we're never going to have any productive discussions. We need to stop judging everything another person says is good or bad, right or wrong, and start really listening to what they're saying, see where they're coming from. My only hope of having you understand me is if I seek to understand you. As a faculty, we need to become very intentional about seeking to understand each other and to understand our students. We need to become models of understanding. We do that by listening and acknowledging the perceptions, thoughts, and feelings of the other person. Too often, our initial response is to agree or disagree without ever really listening and understanding. Judgment shuts people down. Understanding invites dialogue and discussion. So let's look at our mission. What is it that we want for our students and for each other? We want our community to be rooted in both faith and reason. We want to engage a diverse community in learning, leadership, and service. So let's start with learning. Do politics play a role in how we learn? So first thing to notice is our mission is not about teaching. It's about learning. And this is an important distinction. I can sit at home all day long creating curricula and recording lectures, or I can walk into a classroom and talk nonstop for an hour. But at the end of the day, success isn't what I teach. It's what the students learn. The whole point is learning. Teaching is just one means to that end. And we want to empower our students to become lifelong learners who can ask better questions of themselves and find better answers for themselves. We want our students to use their faith and their reasoning abilities every day in their own lives. We want them to learn to discern. We live in the information age. There is so much information available at our fingertips that it becomes, it becomes really hard to know what or whom to believe. These are the facts. No, that's fake news. In fact, the opposite is true. Who do we believe? Google and social media are very good at creating silos and echo chambers that tell us more and more of what we already believe so that we start to think it's just so obvious how right we are and how wrong everyone else is. How do we navigate these pitfalls and in make informed decisions? How can we ever know the truth? Well, there are two ways of discerning truth, and I'm not talking about absolute truth, sir. I'm talking about facts, events, and things we can know. There are two ways that we can know things, through faith and through reasoning. At the University of St. Francis, we value both of these ways of knowing, and we want our students to explore and develop both of these competencies. As a former prosecutor, it was my job to present evidence in court that proved specific facts beyond a reasonable doubt. I presented evidence and argued the facts to persuade the jury that this is what happened. But ultimately, it was up to the jury to decide the facts of the case. In retrospect, I know that there are facts that I proved to the jury 
beyond a reasonable doubt that weren't in fact true. I wasn't intentionally lying, but you look at the you look at the evidence and develop a theory of the case and then weave a story that encourages the jury to fill in the blanks with inferences and deductions that seem like facts that must be true. And then there were other cases where I absolutely believed what a witness, a victim, a survivor told me. The knowing came from a, a place deep inside of me, from my intuition or instinct. But I also knew in my mind that there was conflicting evidence, specific reasons that I could not prove what really happened beyond a reasonable doubt in a courtroom. I did a lot of sex crime cases and I could I could always meet the victim in a reassuring space committed to belief, but I could not take my personal belief to a jury. I had to present evidence and reasoning that proved the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Then from 2010 to 2014, I had three young adult novels, uh, young adult novels published. These were works of fiction but in many ways, it was easier to tell a deeper, more universal truth through fiction than through nonfiction. So there are two complementary ways. Complementary, that's, that's complementary with an E, not with an I, like the kind of compliment I might give you, but two complementary ways that work together for our students to discern facts and truth for themselves, faith and reason. Our mission is to empower them to learn to use both ways and to discern which to use when and how to use them both reliably. I grew up in rural Indiana and I went to Goshen College, Mennonite College as an undergrad because they sent me a brochure that looked like a passport. Goshen required all of their students to do a study service term abroad. And I had it in my mind that if we're all created in the image of God, to better understand God, to know God, I needed to get out of Indiana and out of the United States and see all of the images of God I could. Now, 40 years later, I think of what Voltaire said, God is a circle whose center is everywhere and circumference nowhere. And I think about what one of my classmates told me when we were on the service part of our study service term in Costa Rica on the Guanacaste Peninsula, 20 miles from a paved road, teaching English in a small rural school. He talked about knowing with certainty what he believes and driving his stake in the ground there. He picked the center of God that he was most comfortable with Part of me envied his certainty because I still wasn't sure where I would want to drive my stake in the ground. And it's been 38 years since I saw him or talked to him, and I've often wondered if his stake is still driven in that same place. And if so, how long his tether has grown and how far he's gone in what directions. There are an infinite number of places where we can choose to stand even choose to drive our stake and pitch a tent. But that doesn't mean that we can't reach out and connect with someone in a different place, with different politics and different beliefs, driving their stakes in a place some distance from where we are, because the center is everywhere and the circumference is nowhere. So I was never Mennonite, and I've also never been Catholic, but there are so many Mennonite values and Franciscan values that really resonate with me and that I fully embrace. I am delighted to be part of a community that has committed itself to reverence the unique dignity of each person, to respect creation, and to foster peace and justice. Even those who seem quite different from a distance, if we can connect, we can see how much we have in common and we can build on that.
And that's what I want to happen in my classroom. I want to cultivate connection. And the best way that I've found to do that is through curiosity, openness, and wonder. I like the acronym COW. And I especially like this picture of a Hereford, which is the breed of steers that my brother and I showed at the Miami County Fair back in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So I played with COW as an acronym. I played with holy cow and sacred cows to try and make my point but at the end of the day, I just kept coming back to the cows of my childhood. Back when I was a really little kid and the cows seemed huge. Aside from one of the older bulls though, I really wasn't afraid of them. I was curious and full of wonder. And when my older brother suggested it, I was even open to jumping on their backs and riding them. It's true, we rode cows bareback when we were kids and that's just what we did. We wanted horses, but we only had cows. We were resourceful. We used our imagination. Albert Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. And in this time of fake news, incivility, and divisiveness, I choose to imagine. In the words of John Lennon, imagine all the people living life in peace. Psychologist Mary Piper said that time and moral imagination are the great healers of the human psyche. Time alone won't do it, hasn't done it. As a nation, we need moral imagination. So what is moral imagination? Business ethics expert Patricia Warekane has defined moral imagination in business as our ability to think outside the box and envision ways to be both ethical and successful. It's about letting go of binary, right, wrong, good, bad thinking and becoming more resourceful and more creative in our problem solving. Moral imagination means taking risks. It takes courage and we have to face our fears. Which takes me back to another Dr. Seuss story in that same book with the Sneetchers and the Zacks. In What Was I Scared Of, our hero meets up with someone so different that it frightens him. He yells for help and screams and shrieks until at last he begins to see that I was just as strange to them as they were strange to me. And in the end, they meet quite often and they never shake or tremble, they both smile and they say, hi. We are all unique, but at the end of the day, we are all human beings, more alike than different. And when we seek to understand one another, we can find common ground. The 13th century Persian poet Rumi wrote, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. Again, I want to thank each of you for your time and attention, for being here present with us today. And before we open things up for discussion, questions and answers, I want to leave you with the prayer of St. Francis. Election 2020 has filled our national politics with hatred, injury, doubt, despair, darkness and sadness. But we can choose to sow love, pardon, faith, hope, light, and joy. We can, we can become instruments of peace. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. So I think I've left plenty of time for some discussion. Um, if we run out of time and you'd like to continue the dialogue, you are most welcome to contact me either through my St. Francis email or through my Socratic Parenting contact information.